we're in a time right now of great uncertainty in Europe. Uh, the, the escalation of conflict is continuing. It is building up. The United States is supplying Bradley fighting vehicles, Patriot missiles. Uh, we now have uh, Poland supplying uh, Leopard tanks. Uh, the other tanks are about to come to the fray on the aid of Ukraine. Russia is somewhat less than totally pleased by this picture. And uh, I've got news that the, the, the uh, uh, Mr. Nikolai Petrushkov, uh, he, he is a close ally of, of uh, Vladimir Putin, and he is the head, he's the secretary, that is, of the Russian Security Council, and he is claiming that the West is already at war with Russia. He's just coming, and he's often believed to be the replacement for Vladimir Putin. Well, I got a special guest tonight who has a lot of perspective on this, who's been trying to rally towards some peaceful resolution of all this. You've seen him on my channel before, and that is David Pine. David Pine is the uh, assistant, uh, excuse me, he is the uh, deputy director of operations of the EMP task force, national operations. Let me rephrase it. He is the deputy director of national operations on the EMP task force of national and homeland security. Now I'm a member of that group, but it's still a mouthful. <laughs> I'm the Alabama <laughs> state director. So, uh, uh, Mr. Pine also has served uh, in the Army. He was an arm, armor officer, and he was also an Army uh, civil servant after that, serving in uh, Army headquarters staff uh, negotiation uh, and dealing with weapon systems and exports to, uh, for weapon systems to the Mideast, Eastern Europe, and also involved with what was in the Soviet Union. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Uh, David Pine. David, uh, with all this escalation of stuff we're sending there and Russia's take on it, where do you see this heading? You know, it's it's uh, it's very disturbing to see all the you know the, there's escalation going on on both sides. Uh, you know, the the uh, Biden administration continually crosses uh, line you know red lines that said it would never cross. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's escalating arms shipments. Uh, you know, Bradley fighting vehicles um, and. Uh, perhaps uh, striker uh, armored cars, as well as uh, Patriot missile batteries. And, uh, you know, Russia, Russia is understandably very concerned about that. Um, in addition to that, there have been reports uh, which have been confirmed that uh, the U.S. is engaging in sabotage operations, um, either uh, cyber and or kinetic, most likely both, against Russian military and industrial targets inside the Russian Federation itself. So that's a Major escalation of the war. Uh, eventually, if this, if we continue this, we are certain to get, uh, you know, uh, blowback in the ter in terms of in escalating Russian cyber attacks on uh, targets in the U.S. homeland itself. Uh, but in, in response to that, uh, bit breaking news today: uh, Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin has appointed the uh, Russian military's chief of the general staff. Uh, uh, General uh, Grazimov, Grazimov uh, to uh, be the unified head of uh, all Russian forces in Ukraine. So that indicates that uh, Putin is putting his prestige on the line. This is no longer a special military operation or limited war from the Russian standpoint, as it has been during uh, most of the past year. It is now uh, an actual uh, full-scale war as you mentioned, uh, that they view as being fought against NATO, and it truly is. It truly is. A, it's a limited war that, that Biden has been fighting uh, and NATO has been fighting against uh, Russia using uh, Ukraine, Ukrainians as cannon fodder, essentially. You know, some people don't agree with it, but you know, the whole philosophy of this goes way back to when, uh, way back in Russian history to them trying to control the access points to to mother Russia because most of Russia and including a lot of the land leading up to Ukraine is just big wide open flat plains, which they deem to be all too easy to invade. So they've always tried to extend their empire uh, into the areas of other adjacent peoples and dominate the key passes from which they could be invaded. That's been a long time strategy mm -hmm. of theirs and Putin have pretty much admitted as much uh, back in one of their celebrations uh, uh, of uh, back oh, uh, several months ago. And they um, uh, also had stated at several times with regards to uh, the alliance where Ukraine might be going and they were greatly concerned that Ukraine was falling into the NATO sphere. And they, they you know, to the Western side, from the Western viewpoint, that never made a lot of sense, but uh, we don't th see things the way the Russians do. 
And I'm not trying to justify it one way or the other. I'm just trying to explain that to them, uh, this is a war with the West and we have been slow to see that. And we, we may be proceeding with some peril here. What do you think of that? Well, um, I think you're, I think you're absolutely correct. I think, uh, you know, certainly, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is an illegal war of aggression. However, it, it is a provoked war. It is a war that NATO, uh, the U S uh, NATO and specifically the U S itself has been provoking over the past four, uh, 15 years now. Uh, starting with the Bucharest uh, Declaration uh, of 2000, 2008, in which NATO declared that Ukraine and, and Georgia would join NATO. And since then, we've uh, the Biden administration in particular over the last year, uh, two years actually, has, uh, has repeated that over and over again. Uh, most recently, well, most decisively with the uh, strategic partnership agreement between the US and Ukraine that was declared in November of uh, 2021, which really got us into this mess uh, in which, uh, you know, uh, Russia offered a, a mutual security agreement, which Biden uh, then rejected. Uh, and, uh, you know, that essentially provoked to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Putin had said essentially his minimum demand was that uh, the US and NATO provide a written guarantee that Ukraine would never, never become a NATO member. And that, that is uh, something we could have given with, you know, with absolutely no, um, there was really nothing to prevent us to do that, it would have cost nothing to U.S. national security. In fact, this entire war in Ukraine uh, really has uh, essentially nothing to do with the U.S. national interest. It is not an existential fight, even for Ukraine, and it does not threaten NATO security. In fact, the only thing that is threatening NATO security is the, es is the escalation of U.S., uh, and NATO support for Ukraine and uh, and our escalating sab sabotage attacks against the Russian Federation itself. So um, that is kind of the, the biggest thing I'd like to clear up for your listeners is that um, Russia does not, you know, Putin does not have his sights set on all of Ukraine. He, this is essentially a border dispute. Uh, it's two things. It's a border dispute and it's a dispute about NATO. Uh, it could have been resolved in advance if, the, if uh, President Biden had announced uh, his support for the uh, Minsk II agreement. That was the framework, the preferred framework that uh, Putin had, had uh, really been trying to pursue from 2015 to 2022, up until a couple days before the invasion. But most importantly, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the written guarantee that uh, Ukraine would never join NATO. Uh, but essentially, the, you know, this, the ceasefire that Russia has proposed and that uh, I've advocated the uh, Ukraine should accept would essentially you know, lock in Ukrainian battlefield gains. Uh, Russia would only want the, the Western Donbass region. It currently controls 60% of, the, of uh, the province of Donetsk. Uh, so it would be wanting uh, Western Donetsk, which is perhaps one or 2%, uh, actually about 1% of Ukraine's total territory. What, could you reiterate again the agreement that the Biden administration made with Ukraine that you think precipitated this? Yeah, so back in, on November 10th of 2021, um, uh, the Biden administration signed an agreement with Ukraine, which was uh, a strategic partnership agreement. So it was essentially, it essentially, the way I view it is it formalized Ukraine's de facto NATO membership. Uh, and said that it would become a formal uh, member of NATO uh, in the in the near future. And uh, Putin viewed uh, within, I guess, three weeks after that was signed, uh, Russia began uh, massing its troops on Ukraine's borders. So that was kind of that was kind of the uh, you know the the red line essentially that uh, that, that Biden crossed that triggered this this crisis, uh, which again, could have been avoidable if, you know, even if Obama had been president, this never would, uh, you know, the war would have happened, but he, uh, his policy was to not provide any military aid to Ukraine, knowing that that was a Russian red line and knowing that that would in, invariably lead to conflict with Russia. So he, even Obama was a, a much, much smarter president on foreign policy uh, than Biden. Uh, and then, of course, if Trump had been president, the war would have never occurred in the first place. You know, if Obama had been president, uh, it would have occurred, but then it would have ended very quickly within several weeks by early April, 
uh, with a peace negotiated peace agreement between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And actually, we came very close to that. They had a tentative peace agreement that was hammered out on March 31st in Istanbul. And then uh, Russia withdrew in a pre-announced withdrawal. Uh, they withdrew from the three uh, Ukrainian oblasts of the eight that they occupied. And that kind of emboldened, uh, you know, Western leaders such, you know, including, uh, you know, Boris Johnson, the, pre the previous uh, prime minister of Britain, as well as President Biden, uh, to uh, reinforce Zelensky's desire to, you know, drop all negotiations and fight to the bitter end. Uh, with a blank check of Western military support, which uh, up until that point, you know, the Biden administration, the first few weeks of the war, he was absolutely uh, uh, encouraging negotiate peace negotiations to, uh, you know, prevent further uh, losses in Ukraine. Wow. So what about this? That when Russia and uh, U uh, United States demanded that Ukraine give all their nukes to Russia, there was a peace agreement signed that said, it was a non-aggression peace agreement said neither side would attack Ukraine. And I believe it also obligated each side to come to the defense of Ukraine should Ukraine be attacked or so I'm told. And I'm told by some that we have an obligation on that treaty to defend Ukraine. What, what do you make of that? So that's actually a miss, um, that, that is inc incorrect. That's a, a misunderstood, um, part of the agreement. So that you're referring to, of course, the uh, the Budapest Memorandum of 1994. Right. right. And with the Budapest Memorandum, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan all agreed to uh, give up, or rather to return uh, Soviet nuclear weapons uh, to, uh, to the Russian Federation. And uh, in return, they received a security guarantee in a sense. Really, all, all it committed the U.S. to do uh, was to, uh, to bring a, a a resolution condemning Russian military aggression against Ukraine in the UN General Assembly, and then also to consult with other members of the Security Council, at, other than Russia, of course, uh, to uh, decide how to how to respond. So really, it doesn't provide it doesn't require us to defend Ukraine at all. Uh, and furthermore, I would add that uh, even when it comes to the defense of uh, NATO allies or treaty allies. You know, which in most most circumstances I would advocate we honor and defend against uh, you know Russian or Chinese aggression. I think uh, ultimately it shouldn't be a treaty, uh, a piece of paper that decides what uh, you know what the U.S. should do when uh, you know 250 million Americans, a quarter billion Americans' lives are at stake. I think it should be whatever the U.S. national interest is at the time, and certainly the British Empire. Ran that way. They talked. They had. They said they had uh, famously uh, no permanent allies, only permanent interests. And so uh, the U.S. should should do what is in its absolute, you know, its national security interest uh, to protect, preserve, and defend the United States and its citizens, uh, and and they put the U.S. ahead of any other country. Well, but uh, well, Ukraine, of course, is not an ally. It's not a treaty ally. So we have no obligations to defend it whatsoever. Let's, let's take that a step further. What real interest do we even have in Europe? What what does purpose does NATO today serve the United States in the wake of the breakup of the Soviet Union? It, it, I you know I, I don't think Russia has a long time to run. I think they have some severe demographic demographic issues, as does Europe. But it's it kind of my opinion. If we pulled out and if Russia took all of Europe, Russia would fall apart. Eventually, and Europe would would, would regain, regain its independence, although at great loss. But uh, I, when I was in the army, I was highly disturbed uh, that we spent so much of our time, money, and the blood of our young Americans, and I was, you know, went at risk for that to to go over there and defend a land where they didn't put up the same level of effort in terms of money for their own defense uh, materials. And they used the advantage that we spent our money and tax money and, and national treasure on defending them. And they didn't to build industries that competed with us. So th they were competing with us with industries and they had you know some you know, uh, generous governments to the people. At the same time, we were footing the bill to, to cover them. And I was somewhat less than absolutely ecstatic over that arrangement. I thought that, you know, hey, they're not pulling their own. So I was really happy when Trump uh, popped in and said, man, we ought to put out of NATO. And he really got their attention. And, he, and they stepped up a little bit, but I don't really think they stepped up enough. And with what we're seeing here today, it really makes me wonder. David, 
what are we doing in NATO? Do we need to stay in NATO or should we change the equation somewhat? It seems to me that we are still carrying too much on our backs. That's an outstanding question. You know, uh, President Trump's answer to that uh, question was uh, that no, it was time for the U.S. to leave NATO. And he, he told his, adv his advisors that a few times that we're aware of, um, I think in 2018 and 2019, at both times he was talked out of it. He was said, no, NATO's NATO is the be all end all of U.S. national security. We need to stay in NATO. Wow. But there's no, there's really no reason. Uh, Russia has no designs against NATO, NATO countries. Um, they, uh, you know, Putin, uh, you know, even certainly... if they did, what, what, what skin would we lose if they took them? I mean, what do we well, get out of Europe today? I mean, Europe is not providing anything that we actually really need in this country. I mean, yeah, it's a homeland for a lot of people and there's an emotional connection, but my, you know, it may be because I'm from the South, my ancestors are so far removed. We don't even remember Europe, except for when we got sent over in war to defend it in World War I, my granddad, World War II, my dad. You know, that's yeah. all they knew about Europe. They get sent over there to defend it. You know, that, what, what are we doing over here? <laughs> well, I, I would argue that the U.S. does have a vital national interest in ensuring the freedom and independence of Western Europe, as well as Japan, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, strong industrial uh, powers with, you know, with uh, some military potential and that are aligned with the West, with the U.S. Uh, but uh, with regards to Eastern Europe, and particularly the Baltics and other former Soviet republics, the U.S. has no national interest at all in defending those countries. Uh, I've, yeah, I've been very skeptical since the Baltics were added in 2004 to NATO, uh, whether the U.S. should remain in NATO. And, and my, I, I guess my solution that I've come up with is that uh, the U.S. should uh, reform NATO into a two-tier uh, two -tier system in which uh, the first tier would be Western Europe. Uh, the U.S. would retain its NATO commitment to defend uh, those uh, countries under Article 5. Uh, but then Eastern Europe, uh, the U.S. should renounce uh, its obligation to defend Eastern European countries uh, as, a, as kind of a, a, a require, you know, requirement in order for it to remain a NATO member. And that, that would do, go far to ensure, uh, ensure U.S. national security because Eastern Europe as we've learned from two world wars as a tinderbox, uh, you know, to, uh, it is, it's our, it's regional alliances, it's uh, great power alliances have caused, uh, you know, two regional wars to uh, erupt into, into world wars in Eastern Europe. Uh, the first one, of course, being in Serbia, uh, you know, with the Archduke Ferdinand uh, crisis in July, June and July of uh, 19, 1914, which led to World War I, the loss of maybe 40 million lives, and then uh, World War II, which cost uh, nearly double that, that amount of lives uh, with the Danzig uh, crisis in Poland. So uh, those were both, um, you know, essentially border disputes. This is a third border dispute in Ukraine and Eastern Europe, and it's threatening to erupt uh, into World War III. Why? Because of the great power alliance we have in NATO. Uh, if, if the U.S. were not a NATO member, is, does anyone really believe we would care about Ukraine? No, of course we wouldn't. Uh, Ukraine it only uh, matters to, to the U.S. Uh, deep state elites because it borders on, on uh, NATO, NATO countries. Uh, but as I said, Putin has no ambitions, you know, no uh, territorial ambitions uh, outside of the former Soviet Union and very limited, even, in, you know, relatively limited in Ukraine, uh, you know, totally at most 20% of its uh, internationally recognized territory. Uh, and it was much less than that. It was more like 6.4% of, of Ukraine's pre-war territory uh, until September when uh, uh, Putin proceeded to annex uh, four Ukrainian oblasts as they predicted he would back in April in the event that uh, Zelensky refused to uh, hammer out a peace deal uh, with Moscow. Well, he did what he said he would do in that regard. Now, you know, the, the whole war is a very tragic thing. I, I, I hate war, I abhor war. And, uh, but, you know, it's already launched. Uh, a lot of the cats out of the bag, a lot of water is under the bridge. The things that we could have, should have, uh, is no longer something we can get back to. So we got a, we got a, a hand that's played to us and we got an administration that's determined to take it whichever way they're going to take it. And that seems to be pretty apparent. So what can we do at this point to diffuse this situation? Well, let me first go back to our, the, the last question. Um, so yeah, the discussion we were having, and that is, uh, I wanted to say that I, I 
I've come to believe that our biggest mistake of the post-Cold War era in which we lost the, our Cold War victory um, over the Soviet Union is that we failed to include Russia in the uh, security architecture of Europe. The easiest way we could have done that is we could have invited Russia and Ukraine to join NATO simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, if we had done that prior to, uh, if we'd done that by 1995, Russia and China would never become allies, let alone strategic partners. Uh, the uh, uh, Sino-Russian strategic partnership agreements were not signed until 96. They didn't become formal allies until 2001. So if we had uh, invited Russia to join NATO in, in 1995, uh, it, you know, Putin may have never come to power. And if he had, he would have, uh, you know, pursued his initial kind of pro-Western, um, you know, he was, he was considered very pro-European. Uh, wanting to integrate Russia uh, with uh, with uh, the EU, so uh, you know that of course is kind of a lost dream. You know, if, if uh, uh, when when I first came out with that idea uh, most recently earlier this year, uh, you know, I think there's maybe you can count on uh, one hand, uh, you know, which of the 30 NATO countries would would support that in the event the war in Ukraine was ended. But in terms of um, in terms of what Putin really wants, I mean, he told us exactly what he wanted uh, with his draft, uh, you know, mutual security agreement. Uh, and that's something he came up with back in 2007, by the way. Um, but this was the latest version of it. And essentially what it says is, uh, you know, he's he doesn't care about the NATO. Um, he doesn't want to roll back NATO. A lot of people have said, oh, Putin has demanded, you know, he, uh, we roll back NATO to uh, to its, you know, Cold, Cold War boundaries in which uh, essentially kicking out Eastern Europe uh, and the Baltics. And, and that's just simply not the case. What he said is uh, he wanted uh, all US and Western NATO troops to withdraw from uh, Eastern Europe and all uh, NATO infrastructure to be withdrawn as well. So all bases, any NATO bases with US troops and Western NATO troops would be closed um, and uh, the troops withdrawn. And you know, back at, at the start of the war, we had, uh, I think we had 5,000 US troops total in all of Eastern Europe and uh, other Western NATO countries had 4,000. So if we could even go back to the pre-war status quo of only 9,000 Western NATO troops in Eastern Europe, that would be a huge improvement. And if we could go even, you know, even farther and go back to the pre-2016 uh, NATO status quo in which no Western NATO troops were in Eastern Europe, you know, that, that's a really, an interesting thing a lot of people don't realize is that for 17 years, uh, there were no US troops and no Western NATO troops in, in any Eastern European countries and Russia didn't bother them. You know, Russia didn't, there was no aggression. You know, a lot of people say today, well, we have, yeah, we have 50,000 US troops in Eastern Europe. And if they were to leave, then Russia would just roll in. And that's just, it's not supported by the facts uh, that we that we we know of about Putin's uh, uh, his amb ambitions in Europe, uh, which could are ambitions have very changed. limited. Could his ambitions have changed? Maybe he he wouldn't have then, but after the war and, and what's gone down, maybe he would today. <clears throat> well, I, I think I think the key point for your listeners is that NATO has essentially been the cause of the Russian threat. You know, Russia certainly. So there's two elements of threat. There's there's intent and capabilities. So Russia has always had the capability to destroy the U.S. and NATO, you know, stemming from, I guess, the 60s. Uh, they, they obtained that capability uh, while they, you know, the Soviet Union existed in the 60s or perhaps the late 50s. Um, but in terms of intent, they have not had the intent to do so um, and would only do so in the event they were provoked. You know, Putin has had ample opportunity. He has cyber EMP and nuclear weapons, which could... Uh, erase all of NATO countries, Ukraine and the US off the map of the world, and he's chosen not to use them. So he's, he's uh, even uh, knowing that the, uh, the US is uh, directing and coordinating uh, attacks, destroying targets within Russia itself, uh, you know, and that's not including the, the territories they annexed in Ukraine, Putin has done very little in response. Now, you know, there's uh, I'm sure your listeners are aware of the two-hour breakdown of, uh, you know, the FAA, um, you know, computer network, uh, which they right. had to ground all U.S. flights. That was likely a cyber attack, either from Russia or China. Uh, so they have uh, uh, incredible capabilities. They, they could shut us down 
within uh, you know hours, if not minutes, and they've chosen not to do so yet. But unfortunately. Uh, all of these provocations uh, over time, you know, if extended and, and increased, uh, make a cyber, you know, massive cyber attack that could, you know, kill millions of Americans much more likely. And that's, you know, that as a EMP, you know, the task force of national Homeland security, Homeland security that you and I help lead, our purpose is, is to defend, you know, ensure that uh, Americans are defended and protected against not just EMP threats, but also nuclear and cyber threats as well. And part of that, part of what we can do as an organization to defend the US is to promote a uh, more realist uh, foreign policy that's less provocative. Uh, because as I said, there's, there's intent and there's capability. Russia and China will always have the capability to destroy us, North Korea like as well. But uh, if we can come to accommodations with them, and I wouldn't call it an appeasement, you know, because we, you know, we're going to defend our treaty allies, at least in terms of the, the strategy that I've been promoting, but we shouldn't be intervening and, and interfering in their spheres of influence. And that would include Ukraine, the former Soviet Union outside of the Baltic states, and, uh, and Taiwan and the South China Sea. So we have to come to some kind of understanding with the uh, Moscow and Beijing that we will keep our military forces and you know arms outside of their spheres of influence, just as we have, you know, we claim a sphere of influence over uh, you know two different continents, not just uh, you know North and South America, and uh, you know Russia and and China as nuclear superpowers with, I would argue, uh, you know more nuclear more nuclear weapons than than we have today uh, that they have deployed. Either one of them have have more at this point. Uh, Russia has several times more. Um, you know, if we don't, um, you know, if we if we stop essentially um, poking the Russian bear in the eye, uh, if we don't do that, then we risk the destruction of the country, the great country we love. Uh, that's what worries me. Some people think Russia is not going to respond. They've committed. I've got friends who say Russia's committed such crime that uh, we need to go right in there and uh, hold them accountable, put them on trial for war crimes. And I think that would be the existential threat level that absolutely would make them respond. And then they come back and says, well, no, Russia can't even launch anything, and, but yet they're launching stuff. So uh, I, find, I find some of the uh, viewpoints out there uh, Let's say highly interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> be charitable. Uh, what do you think the actual risk of a nuclear war is? Where do you think the real red lines are? What would really prompt Putin to launch a nuclear war? And how close are we? tactical, strategic? Uh, e e look at each one of those. And how close do you think we are to that? Well, let me start with, uh, you know, Rebecca Koffler, of course, uh, a former DIA uh, Russia analyst has, has stated um, that the risk of the current risk of Russian nuclear escalation is around 30 percent. I think that's accurate. Uh, that would include either uh, EMP or uh, tactical nuke uh, nukes uh, employed against Ukraine to force their conditional surrender. Um, so I think that's I think that's absolutely on the table. Uh, the more that we do to help Ukraine. Uh, win battlefield, uh, you know, battles. Uh, the, the greater the chance that we provoke Putin to uh, to win the war, and just in in days if, uh, or less than a week with uh, using nuclear, cyber, or EMP weapons. Well, let me put that in perspective so people understand what thirty percent means. That is like playing Russian roulette with a six shooter revolver when you add two bullets in. You add two in the chamber, you spin it, and you put it to your head. Uh, is this the kind of thing that we want to be doing, taking a 30% risk? Uh, is, 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 you've got to ask yourself, is to, to our homeland here, is it worth us taking that kind of risk? That's, that's a discussion that's not been held at the national level. And I'm not going to presuppose the answer. Uh, I've got my opinions about that. But uh, this discussion has not been held. People are just automatically... Uh, making those decisions for us and, and without uh, due course of conversation, in my humble opinion, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, people just don't realize, I mean, uh, Biden 
uh, President Biden himself has admitted that we're closer to a nuclear apocalypse than at any time we, we've ever been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that's 61, you know, at the time it was 60 years. Uh, you know, during most of the Cold War, we were not this close to, to nuclear war. Now, I will say that um, I don't believe that uh, Russian nuclear use or EMP use, yeah, super EMP weapon use in Ukraine, I don't think that would lead to a nuclear war with Russia. Um, I think that would, uh, most likely, I think Biden would not respond militarily. So I think that would actually um, encourage him and cause him to uh, to pressure Ukraine, say, hey, this is this has gone nuclear. Uh, we need to uh, support a ceasefire. You know, get. I'll, I'll help you get the best peace deal you, uh, we can get. But uh, short of moving more troops to to Eastern Europe, I don't think Biden would do anything militarily. To be honest, I, I mean, certainly there's a chance that there's a lot of crazy people like General Petraeus and other retired four-star generals in the deep state that are, are calling on you know the U.S. to uh, annihilate, you know, uh, stage a massive uh, conventional bombing campaign and strikes against uh, targets inside the Russian Federation that uh, include, you know, Crimea and other, and the four Ukrainian oblasts. Um, but we've never, you know, people don't realize we've never, in our history, we've never directly fought another nuclear power. And there's a very good reason for that, because uh, you fight another country, you know, let alone a country like Russia with over four times more nukes than we have. Uh, but you fight another nuclear power and the chance of nuclear escalation are, are very high. I mean, they're almost, um, I mean, certainly at least cyber and EMP, I mean, they're inevitable. I would, I would say that if we fight China over Taiwan directly, if we fight Russia over Ukraine directly, uh, minimally we'll get uh, have a massive, uh, you know, cyber Russian Chinese cyber attack that will take out the U.S. and uh, you know shut down our power, uh, our internet, uh, all our entire financial system, our uh, economy, critical infrastructure, you know, all of our satellites, GPS, early warnings, uh, you know, food distribution, food and water distribution, water purification systems. It's the same. It's a very similar scenario to EMP. Um, and my hope is, if it comes to that, which would be disastrous, you know, the difference between I tell people when I when I give briefings um, here in Utah and and, and on with video interviews, the main difference between cyber and EMP is that EMP is is almost permanent. You know, it's almost the it's almost the permanent destruction of our critical infrastructure, whereas cyber can be temporary. Uh, it can be turned on and off and in an ideal uh, scenario, if there is a massive cyber attack that uh, shuts us down, uh, if Russia and China would give their kind of their blackmail peace terms, like essentially a ransom and say, we don't want any of your money, but these are the terms you'll have to adhere to in order to avert, in order to, for us to uh, restore your, uh, your systems and lift our cyber attacks. And, and those terms, of course, would be the US would have to pull out of, uh, of the Russian and Chinese spheres of influence um, minimally and never send any weapons again. Uh, but that's what we should do. That's what we should do in our, in our national security interests. And if we did that, the threat of uh, Russian and Chinese cyber EAP and nuclear attack would go you know, from the greatest we've had essentially sent in the last 60 years uh, to a much lower and, and more reasonable level uh, that would go far to enhance and ensure uh, U.S. national security. Did you hear about the hacking group Cold River, which did a fishing uh, tax on uh, Brookhaven, Oregon, and the National Livermore uh, laboratories? Them, you know, these are our, a lot of our key national nuclear laboratories, and apparently they were already the Russians were already trying to hack those this this, this past year. So you could say this has already begun to some level. Now that's not the shut everything down level, but it is out there. So yeah, yeah ab absolutely. So the uh, the day either the day of the Russian invasion of Ukraine or the day after um, Russian cyber attacks against the U.S. escalated eight times by eight hundred percent. Wow. Um, and currently, uh, it's about a million uh, Russian cyber attacks a day on the on the U.S. Wow. Uh, so obviously, mo uh, those are low level attacks. A lot of you know a lot of them are probing and you know stealing information, but um, you know. 
really, I mean, tests of their ability, capabilities in terms of, you know, shutting down, uh, you know, our, our fuel pipelines in 14 states has occurred, you know, last, last year, the year before, and then, uh, you know, likely with this uh, two hour shutdown of, of, our, of our flight system as well, um, you know, they can do so much more and they will do it if we continue along this path of escalation against uh, Russia and China. You know, uh, Reagan was pursued a policy of peace through strength. Biden, I, I feel, is pursuing a policy of war through weakness. You know, yeah. we were, uh, you know, we, we at least had, had rough military nuclear parity with the Soviet Union. They respected us because we, you know, we were, we were strong. Uh, today, the U.S. under Biden is, is much weaker relatively to, to Russia and China. And unlike the Cold War, Russia and China are close military allies. So that really changes the equation. You know, in a in a superpower, uh, you know, or nuclear or great power scenario, you you always want to be this the side that's uh, superior that has the most population, uh, the most military potential, the, the the greatest economic potential, industrial power. And in this case, we're overmatched in all four of those areas. We have you know, much less population in terms of Western countries versus uh, the Sino-Russian alliance. Uh, China has 120% uh, greater, uh, larger economy than we do. Um, they have twice our uh, manufacturing industrial capabilities. And then uh, technologically, they're on par overall, but in key weapon systems, they are, uh, they are more advanced than we are. And that's, that's something we never had during the Cold War. I mean, the Soviets did have, they were more advanced in a few, a few systems, but then, um, you know, but overall, you know, we had the nuclear forces to balance that out. We had 7,200 nuclear weapons in Europe alone. Today, we have no more than 200, you know, so we've, we've uh, disarmed unilaterally of 94% of our nuclear arsenal. And meanwhile, Russia and China have been um, massively rebuilding theirs. Yeah. Uh, China's has never been larger and they're, they're on track to, uh, build up to, uh, you know, 4,500 nuclear weapons, um, which is, you know, much, much larger than what we have deployed today with our 50, you know, 1,715 nuclear weapons. Yeah. Hey, just for a quick shameless plug, that's why people need to prepare. <laughs> you go to prepwithgreg.com, you find $100 off a special right now of one month supply of food last uh, 25 years, 2,000 calories a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the new, uh, Deputy uh, Director for the MP Task Force, John Hollerman, will tell you that that's a lot better than other competitors when you get 2,000 calories a day, because most only give you 800. So check it out, prepwithgreg.com. Yeah, you, you really need to get ready for this stuff, guys. Now, I'll get off that real fast and back to the topic here. Um, you know, what we have uh, really a composite risk between Russia and China. Yeah, and it's when you bring China in that uh, we're at grave, the graver risk, because America has won every war it's won is a war of attrition. We do have more industrial power than Russia. They have more nukes than us presently, but we do have more industrial power, manpower, and a bigger economy than Russia. But when you pull the China into the equation, uh, it don't look so pretty at all. There's no way at the present we would win with China as a war of attrition unless we could blockade them and cut them off from all their resources. I mean, but Russia gives China kind of a, a get out of jail free card on to some degree in that area because they're building pipelines and other avenues of, of getting resources into China. So that alliance puts uh, America at peril. And, and, you know, I had back in the past, I mean, like three years ago, at least done inter uh, videos on my channel where I said, hey, we should make peace with Russia and, uh, and get an alliance with them against China because I saw the real threat in China. And I know that in the long term, even if Russia and China took the United States out. They're going to turn on each other and China will win. And Russians know that. So Russians have to be somewhere uh, in their deep, darkest reserves, more concerned with China than us. And I think we really blew it by not doing that. Now, this is water in the bridge. I don't know if we, how we can repair things today with all the broken eggs that are out there. But And I've got a lot of good friends who are absolutely 100% pro-Russian. I got friends who are absolutely 100% pro-China, uh, pro uh you know, uh, Ukraine and the conflict over there, I'm not trying to take sides here. I'm just trying to look at the threat that we face as Americans. Uh, so with well, that said, when you look, now you said it was 30% probability of war, nuclear war, and that's talking about Russia. When you pull China into this and you look at the composite risk of what's going on 
in Ukraine, uh, Taiwan, the potential for China to invade Taiwan. What do you think the composite risk for nuclear war uh, is it that the United States, this is just based on your assessment, what do you see as the composite risk over the next 10 years? You know, that's a really difficult question. And, and the ultimate answer, uh, I think no one but Biden knows, because, you know, we know Biden is a controlled asset of, of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, he's, you know, he's received, uh, you know, his family's received a 31 million that we know from China. Uh, we just had revelations that he was uh, paid a million dollars for his role uh, uh, as, um, I don't know, chairman of the Biden, Penn, the, the Penn Biden Center, uh, in which he was, uh, it was recently revealed that he had uh, uh, a significant number of uh, top secret SCI, you know, secret compartmentalized information intelligence papers uh, that were unguarded, uh, you know, in an unsecure environment. Uh, and that's an impeachable offense, I would argue, in and of itself. Where, but the where, fact where China had Trump is uh, said that China had <laughs> access to that. Is that true? We don't know if China had access to it. However, I think it's likely they did. Um, uh, there's been at least 55 million um, paid by China by anonymous Chinese donors, likely, you know, government affiliated uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party members. Uh, paid to finance the uh, the Biden Center, and of course, you know, one million of that we know uh, went to uh, Biden's personal bank account. So, so far that we know of, you know, there's likely one million from that in Chinese uh, communist money. Uh, then there's also um, he's received uh, another uh, at least three million, three point one million. You know, uh, the ten percent is the big guy essentially. Uh, that that uh, into his private bank account. And it was revealed last year that uh, Biden, there was a $5.2 billion or million dollar discrepancy uh, between in Biden's tax records between uh, the income that he can account for and what he can account for. So clearly, uh, you know, there's a bunch of, uh, you know, criminally flagged uh, bank transactions uh, that have occurred that Hopefully, the, the House GOP majority will, uh, you know, will investigate um, Chairman Comer and the Oversight Committee and others, uh, Jim Jordan at uh, Judiciary. Um, and we need, we just need to find out to what extent is, is, is uh, you know, we know that Biden is a, is a controlled asset, but to what extent is he controlled? Is he controlled to the extent that uh, in the event of, you know, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, you know, he'll kind of... Um, you know that that he is he gonna is he gonna oppose that in any way or is he uh, simply gonna do economic sanctions now? Uh, from my standpoint, I think an economic war against China would be the best response to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Uh, if in fact the U.S. sends you know our, our naval and air forces, you know I mean the, uh, if we declare war against China, obviously our our forces in 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 theater will get mostly wiped out uh, in preemptive strikes. Uh, against our military bases, especially in Okinawa and Guam, and also the North Marianas. Uh, but in, are we going to, you know, send send additional forces to try to break the Chinese blockade of Taiwan? Uh, because if we do that, you know, they're going to respond with, uh, you know, what's uh, cyber strikes, a massive cyber attack against the U.S., uh, possibly nuclear strikes against U.S. military bases and our allies. So. Uh, yeah, the point I want to drive home once again is it's how the U.S. is, uh, it's U.S. actions and U.S. responses to, uh, you know, Russian and Chinese military actions that is is putting at risk our, our allies. Because the quickest way to to destroy our treaty allies is to is to get in, in, uh, involved in a war with China over Taiwan, because they'll be the first ones to go, you know. Uh, Japan's like would likely get nuked, uh, South Korea as well, uh, perhaps Australia. Um, and the quick, the easiest way to secure them is to come to an agreement, uh, like I propose, some kind of reunification agreement uh, with uh, China and Taiwan, in which the rights of the Taiwanese, you know, would be protected. Now, of course, we we know that you know that the likelihood of, of uh, China uh, honoring such an agreement is is uh, modest at best, uh, but if we could, uh, we could 
we could uh, secure limited guarantees, uh, perhaps um, have the, uh, you know, the, uh, the nationalist, uh, old nationalist Chinese that, uh, party, the, the Kuomintang, uh, which uh, Chiang Kai-shek led that uh, when it relocated to Taiwan, they're currently the opposition party. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if we were to say that, that they would be in charge of Taiwan, essentially under uh, Chinese supervision, you know, things like that, um, you know, ensuring uh, immigration, you know, amnesty for any for opponents, uh, immigrate, you know, allowing anyone to leave Taiwan, uh, and then, you know, some limited political and religious religious rights. Uh, but essentially, there's nothing we can do. There's, as President Trump recognized in John Bolton's book, recent most recent book, uh, he quoted Trump as saying, uh, Taiwan is is 80, 80 miles from, or actually he said 100 miles from China um, and like 8,000 miles from the U.S. It's actually 81 miles from China and about 6,900 miles uh, from, from the U.S., but who's counting? Uh, but essentially what he said, because of that, there's literally nothing we could do to defend Taiwan. It's, it's an unwinnable war, even more so than Ukraine. It's an unwinnable war for the U.S., if we get involved, we lose. Uh, there was a recent war game that uh, that I uh, I participated or I, I I joined the webinar that that discussed the war game. And essentially, what they said is, um, if if we use nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons to uh, against China, we lose. If they use them against us first, we lose. It's an you know in a nuclear conflict with China. We're going to lose, uh, and the reasons for that are they have overwhelming theater nuclear superiority in the region. They have the largest nuclear ballistic missile force in the in the world, uh, nuclear capable. Um, they would have, according to one of our top naval experts at the Center for Security Policy, uh, they would have a ten to one advantage over us in in warships in any naval fight. Uh, so it's just really it's not a balanced fight. And you know, in accordance with the, what I call the Reagan Weinberger Powell doctrine, is you 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 never fight wars that you can't win. You have to have uh, a set of achieve an achievable aim, an objective. And if you if you you don't commit U.S. forces to a war you can't win, like Vietnam. Vietnam, of course, being the, the quintessential no win war. Now, I believe we could have won Vietnam. You know, we, we could have if we had had the the, the political uh, willpower, we could have. Obviously, we could have invaded and occupied uh, North Vietnam, and we could have won that way, just in that sense. But the way we fought it was a no-win war, and it should never have been fought because we were too constrained. Uh, but we we didn't have the we had the advantage of fighting the Cold War, you know, the wars in Korea and Vietnam with U.S. nuclear superiority. Today, we live in a world with Russian and Chinese nuclear superiority. So that is a world in which you know. Uh, we're, we're not going to win major wars, direct wars against Russia and China. Well, there has been some recent uh, simulation that claims, yeah, most of them have said that, but one recent one has said uh, that China couldn't win trying to take and invade uh, Taiwan. Of course, that presupposed our involvement, but it would come at heavy cost to all, all parties involved. You know, I don't know. That's the thing about war is you never know which way it's going to go. Uh, you know, you, you can have the best plans, but you know, no, no good plan survives first contact with the enemy, uh, and it's it, it just gets messy. Wars are messy by definition, so <clears throat> it's not a pretty situation. Now, all that said, I, I just want to, in defense of Taiwan, for a little bit, uh, look at it from the other side. We need to, we might have a special conversation just on China, so we probably won't cut this short. But if uh, Taiwan falls, I think. Uh, in the, South Korea and Japan are going to be in a real tough situation. If uh, even if it don't fall, even if, it, if China takes over a major chunk of the first island chain, that with what they got in the first uh, in the South China Sea, they could own that area and uh, deny access and trade routes to South Korea and Japan, and that would put them in a, a severe disadvantage to the point that uh, they might declare war on China on their own because they're going to be in peril over that. So what, what do you think of that? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, I've always said that China's uh, master plan is not to wage war, direct war against the U.S. and its allies. It's to take us over economically. 
So, uh, you know, that's really their preference. Uh, you know, uh, President Xi's preference is to achieve Chinese global hegemony, not by troops, not by, you know, I mean, certainly he is expanding uh, China's military bases uh, across the world, but um, uh, he would prefer not to have to occupy the U.S. or occupy our U.S. allies or, or risk nuclear war with us. Uh, he would prefer rather to, uh, to simply buy up our country. He's already, you know, bought up our politicians. Uh, he owns, uh, China owns 75 to 80 percent of U.S. Uh, or uh, our farm farmland and food production uh, facilities here in Utah. So, uh, you know, it's been a slow process. They've been buying, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, strategic. How much in Utah? Uh, over 75 percent of U Utah food production is owned by China. Are you serious? 75 yeah. percent? That is, how do we permit that? I mean. I personally don't think it's desirable to have a, a, a nation who uh, don't don't care for freedom come in this country and acquire such a, a swath of our resources. I, I really am not for being uh, conquered economically. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, what I'm trying to say is uh, I don't I don't you know there's a lot of this whole the first and second island chain chain, chain uh, arguments. I just don't, I don't agree with them. I, I don't think that uh, our allies would be more at risk if uh, China were to, to uh, reunify with uh, Taiwan through uh, Chinese aggression. Um, I think we, we draw, what we do is we draw a line in the sand around our treaty allies uh, in the Pacific. That would be Japan, South Korea, um, Australia, and the Philippines. And uh, we say, you know, this far and no farther, essentially. So you know, that would expose, you know, small island nations in the Pacific uh, to potential Chinese invasion and occupation. But we would not, uh, we would make it clear that uh, we will defend militarily our treaty, our four treaty allies in the Pacific. And I think China would respect that. I really do, you know, I really do. I don't think that they would cross that line uh, because it would be a line that would not, you know, would not cross into uh, their, their own sphere of influence. Um, so I, I think, you know, I think we need to do that with Russia as well and, and say, you know, NATO is the line, you know, and we're not going to aid Ukraine anymore. We're going to cut off military aid to Ukraine. And that would force uh, Zelensky very quickly to uh, accept a, the Russia's ceasefire offer uh, that would essentially keep the line of control along the same line that it is right now. And, you know, that's that's a travesty, of course. I mean, I. Uh, if I had my personal way, I would uh, eject the uh, Russian troops out of the Donbass. I would let them keep Crimea because Crimea is 75% um, Russian, ethnically. Um, but that's just not the world we live in. You know, and Henry Kissinger and, and Nixon and other, other realists, you know, realize that there are limits to, to U.S. military power. And that's uh, never been more true today. And, uh, you know, we can, we can live in a world defined by... Uh, America's Cold War victory, and we can keep NATO's boundaries where they're at, you know, into the Soviet space in, in the Baltics, uh, but we just can't, we can't keep expanding. You know, Ukraine has always been the red line for Russia. Ukraine is the number one vital interest for, the, uh, for, for Putin, for Russia, and, and, you know, we've crossed it. And that's why, that's why Russia invaded. Uh, if we, if we had, uh, you know, accepted uh, Putin's proposal to make Ukraine, uh, you know, return it to neutral buffer state status as it was under uh, President Yakunovich, uh, then that would have uh, prevented the invasion, um, you know, the Russian invasion of uh, Eastern and Southern Ukraine. So uh, we need to get back to, to a clear-eyed foreign policy realist uh, strategy that, that won us the Cold War um, and reestablish these nuclear kind of these these safeguards we had, uh, which JFK, you know, has wisely established, uh, which got, prevented a, a, a nuclear war in the 1960s over Cuba, uh, in which, uh, you know, he, uh, he gave, actually, uh, a lot of people don't realize that JFK gave more to the Soviets than he got back from the Soviets. He repudiated the West, you know, the Monroe Doctrine and said, we'll let Cuba remain communist and definitely we'll never invade them. Um, he, he said, well, we'll draw all of our medium range uh, ballistic nuclear missiles from Italy and, and uh, from Turkey uh, in exchange for, you know, the withdrawal of uh, Soviet missiles from Cuba. And that, you know, that saved the lives of, he estimated, 100 million Americans. And I think that might be true. 
Uh, and, and we have we have the chance right now to implement a, an America first national security strategy that I've uh, been advocating that could save 250 million American lives and, you know, an equal number of, uh, of European and Asian lives, if not um, many, many more than that. So, uh, you know, we really need to uh, fundamentally rethink our, our foreign policy and national security strategy. We need to abandon our strategy of liberal hege hegemony that the deep state and the globalists have been advocating uh, and pursuing over the past 30 years that have got us into, you know, these huge uh, national security messes uh, that any one of which, you know, with uh, North Korea, China, or, or Russia could result in the destruction of our, our great country. And, uh, you know, that's something we, we need to, we need to avoid, we need to abandon the hubris we have, you know, I mean, Republican congressmen, you know, they talk about, you know, escalating the war on Russia and, and fighting China over Taiwan. And, and they're just, they're completely devoid of any, uh, they're not grounded in reality. And that's a very dangerous thing, when, you know, uh, when the other side, uh, it, when their, their leaders are more rational actors than our own, uh, that can get us into, uh, into a, a third world war that, that we can't win. Okay, I buy that. So let me ask you, let me ask you this, given the current administration that's gonna be in power for two more years, uh, they've got the Senate. The Congress is, you know, who knows where they're going to go in terms of the House, as, as you just mentioned. Uh, what, you know, this war will probably be over in two years. So what, what realistically, given the cards were dealt, who's in power, what realistically can we do at this point? What can, what should the citizens here do? Who should they call? Who should they ring their bells to, to take some kind of action. And what should that action be? What can we do? Well, I think, uh, I think we have a shot. You know, we have a fighting chance with the Republicans returning to control uh, the, uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, you know, the deep state obviously is firmly in control of, of the Senate on both sides, you know, with uh, McConnell and, uh, and Schumer. Uh, but in the House, um, you know, McCarthy is, uh, you know, he's not a deep stater, but he's not, you know, an American first conservative either. He's kind of in between, uh, but but he's open, you know, obviously, you know, as, as his 15 votes for speakership demonstrated, uh, the America first conservatives that oppose uh, war with Russia over Ukraine and oppose continued uh, military aid to Ukraine, uh, they have a substantial say and they can do a motion to vacate at any time. And if the Democrats join with them, you know, McCarthy's gone, he's toast. So, uh, you know, they have a real say and uh, a chance to influence, you know, national security policy. So I think uh, what we do is, you know, President Trump has uh, stated it's, it's vitally important that we pursue a ceasefire with Ukraine, with Russia and Ukraine. And, you know, uh, he and other America First conservatives have talked about the need for U.S. and, Ru uh, the US and Russia to negotiate directly, uh, ideally without even Ukrainian participation, because you know, what Biden has essentially done is he has subcontracted uh, U.S. national security policy regarding Russia to Zelensky. And Zelensky is a hothead. You know, he is he is not someone we want to make the decision to uh, what, you know, whether to uh, get us in World War Three with with Russia, because he's already made clear that's his that's his goal. He's right. made clear since April right. his his ultimate goal is to is to embroil the U.S. and NATO in a war with Russia, uh, which he he naively thinks won't turn nuclear, uh, won't you know won't escalate to the EMP level, um, because he knows that's his only potential hope for regaining uh, control of Crimea and the Donbas region. Um, what he doesn't realize is that uh, that would uh, threaten. That is the only thing that will threaten Ukraine's existence is uh, continuation of, of the war. You know. I mean, essentially, the you know Russia's on the verge of a, a winter, massive winter counteroffensive, or offensive, uh, that which Ukraine is predicting will likely occur in um, in early February, and uh, Putin has, has expanded the, permanently expanded the size of, of the Russian army by five hundred thousand troops, so active duty troops. So uh, you know we started the war with two hundred eighty thousand uh, Russian army active duty troops. Now he's going to have maybe seven hundred eighty thousand. So that's that's a huge expansion. And already, um, you know, Russia has uh, doubled the number of troops in Ukraine. Uh, so it no longer is, 
has a, a disadvantage. You know, it's been fighting the fighting the war for most most of the uh, all of last year uh, with a numerical uh, disadvantage to Ukrainian troops. Ukrainian forces have enjoyed a two to one or three to one numerical advantage over over Russian troops in Ukraine. So that's that's going to change. Uh, Russia is likely to achieve uh, parity or superiority. And with that, uh, with those num numerical increases, they, they're going to be able to retake probably, uh, you know, all of the territory that they lost, uh, certainly since September with the Ukrainian counteroffensive. I would submit that time is not on Ukraine's side. I have seen this war a lot like the American war between the states in which the South was winning for two years. And, and I mean, winning fabulously. And, but the South could not hold up over the long term, the long game, because we didn't have the manpower and materials. We didn't have the manufacturing. Uh, and we uh, got out of treated by the Northern States. The, uh, the, you know, they just kept bringing more men. And the end of the war, the Confederate Army was staffed by old men and boys. And uh, it was a very ugly situation. And I see Ukraine been, you know, Ukraine, uh, when they lose a fighter, they don't replace it so easily. You know, the Russian fighters may not, you know, be uh, the best, in, you know, there are out there in the field, but they can just keep throwing so many of them in this and uh, their factories can keep churning. Uh, they've lost a lot of stuff, but in the long term, time is not on Ukraine's side. If Ukraine wants a victory, they got to move really fast and make it happen within the next. I'd say half a year, I, but I, I'm skeptical that they could actually accomplish that. So I, I think the negotiated treaty is the best way and, and, and something needs to be done to put a stop to the carnage. Uh, and it will, I think both sides would benefit because I think the long term in this is going to be ugly. I know a lot of people think that, you know, that uh, Ukrainians should take back every ounce in, in Crimea to boot. But uh, I, I have a hard time seeing them taking Crimea without uh, a, a real escalation. If Putin lets them take Crimea without escalating the nuclear, then I'd be surprised. But maybe he will. Maybe he will. But I certainly don't see him rolling into Moscow. You know, that's what, you know, <laughs> Zelensky said he wants to try for war crimes. To do that, he's got to roll into Moscow. That's an yeah. essential threat. That's definitely, I don't see how that's not a, a red line for nuclear war. I just can't see how that's not a red line for nuclear war. Now, maybe... He feels like he needs to be vindicated because of what the Russian troops have done in Ukraine, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, of course, you know, you know the, the people in Donetsk, they want some vindication too, I suppose. So there's, wars are ugly. It's a feud. And yeah. And both sides get hurt. It's not, there's nothing pretty. A lot of people who listen to this broadcast have heard from one side or the other, and a lot of them are taking sides. I'm trying not to do that here. I'm trying to take our side as Americans to say, That's right. why are we in this? What can we do? We need to cut our losses. And That's right. That's negotiated exactly right. peace treaty, I think, is is a, a route to cut our losses. And I think in the end, the, the, it'll, it'll cut the bloodshed in both Europe and Russia. Yeah. I mean, it's it's that's exactly right. And that's what I've said all the time, the whole time. Um, I don't take Russia's side. I'm not pro-Russia in any way. Um, I don't take uh, Ukraine. I've been you know a little bit more partial to Ukraine, sympathetic, sympathetic wise. But really, um, I support America. I mean, and a lot of people fail to realize is they conflate Ukraine's interests or America's interests with Ukraine's and it's, they're completely polar opposite. You know, uh, as I said, uh, Zelensky is doing everything he can to get Russia and the, you know, the US and Russia into a, into a full scale uh, world war. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's literally the, the polar opposite uh, of our national security interests, which is to avoid Avoid a direct war with Russia and China that, that we would likely lose, and that, that could, you know, cost the lives of 250 million Americans. But um, yeah, I always, I always uh, have to chuckle whenever I hear that uh, Ukraine's winning the war, that Russia's on the ropes, and you know, Putin's about to be removed. Uh, I mean, let's be realistic here. The Russian Federation is is uh, at least 29 times larger than Nazi Germany at its greatest extent, and uh, Ukraine has failed to occupy any Russian territory. Uh, you know, of at least pre-war ter Russian territory, and you, uh, Russia still controls nearly 20% of, of Ukraine. So is Ukraine really winning if, if Russia, if they control 0% of Russia and uh, Russia controls 20% of, of Ukraine? Obviously, the narrative is wrong. Uh, General Mark uh, Milley, has, you know, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has stated, you know, Ukraine's essentially hit its high watermark, and, and that's absolutely true, borne out by the facts that Back in October, November, 
that's as much territory as they're ever going to be able to take. And the time to negotiate was then and it's yeah. now because yeah. from here on out, Ukraine is going to lose and we won't be able to, you know, the, the deep state media, regime media is not going to be able to cover that up. You know, as Russia will, will retake, you know, town after town, city after city, uh, you know, perhaps even region after region over the, over the coming year. Um, and up to the point where, you know, that the, the uh, Ministry of Defense of Ukraine is predicting that uh, Putin's going to take a second shot at, at uh, taking Kiev, uh, the Ukrainian capital. And that's, uh, that's definitely a possibility. But even if they were to simply surround Ukrainian forces, uh, army troops in, uh, in southeastern Ukraine, um, you know, I've, I've talked about how they could do a, a pincer maneuver, uh, go up from uh, from Kyrzon along uh, the, east, the eastern bank of the, the um, Dnipro River, uh, Dnipro River in Ukrainian, and then uh, from uh, you know from Sumy or there that direction uh, in a, a southwestern direction, they they could potentially uh, surround you know 50, 60 thousand Ukrainian troops, and then Ukraine would might you know they they, they would have lost their, uh, mo most of their best troops and. Uh, that would expose the rest of Ukraine to potential Russian occupation. So uh, it's just a matter of time, uh, as you met, you alluded to. Uh, Russia, the Russian economy is currently about 15 times larger than Ukraine. They have four times the population. They have uh, four to five times as many troops uh, available. You know, not in Ukraine, but in terms of uh, uh, active uh, reserve forces that can be fully mobilized uh, within a matter of three months, 90 days. Um, and of course, they have 8,000 more nuclear weapons. Uh, Ukraine has none. And uh, in the very fact the U.S., there's not a single country in the world that has sent combat troops officially to fight Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's the battle, the, uh, the war of attrition, as you mentioned, it's, it's very much against Ukraine. Uh, yes, Poland has sent thousands of troops, uh, volunteers to fight uh, as unofficial you know, volunteers, uh, the Polish Legion. Uh, we found out recently that they lost 1,200 dead Polish troops. Uh, but we also heard from the EU president that um, the Euro European Union president has stated that uh, Ukraine has lost 100,000 dead troops. And that's, uh, that's likely three to four times as many as Russia has lost. So we're not hearing the full truth. Uh, the problem with uh, with you know having a republic and being able to keep keep a constitutional republic is you have to have an informed electorate and you have to have a moral electorate. Um, I don't think we have a moral electorate. We definitely don't have an informed electorate. You know, uh, we have a misinformed electorate. And uh, you know, despite the fact that you know Biden is always complaining about misinformation, disinformation, they are the uh, they and you know the Biden administration and the, re the Biden regime media are the prime purveyors of disinformation. I would argue perhaps even more so than the than Russia itself. You know, uh, we hear, you know, 80% of what we hear about the war in Ukraine is, is largely disinformation. It's a very slanted viewpoint. Doesn't reflect uh, what's actually happening in the war. That's why I try to warn people on my channel. They come up with me with all this and now I'm getting hit on both sides of stuff. And I say, look, it's all propaganda. You get tons of propaganda come from both sides of this equation. So, you know, the, a lot of that is just bunk. But anyway, all righty. Wars are messy. They're ugly. We just need to end this <laughs> if we can. Exactly. All right, David. Hey, I appreciate you very much. I appreciate you for what you do uh, for our national security. And uh, but we'll, we'll do this again. And we might pick up China next time. Maybe, maybe we won't be too long because there's a lot to cover in these areas. And we've not talked in a while. Uh, I think you got picked up and made a superstar on Canadian prepper side after <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. I think it was you I have to thank for that connection. So I really appreciate that. I've had two interviews on, on uh, with Nate on Canadian Prepper. Yeah, he's got a big channel. You. You get a lot of attention there. So that's good. Yep. Anyway, and I hope he's doing well. So if he's watching, hey, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David, take care. And All right, you too. Take care. Thanks a lot. We'll thanks for all you do. Thank you, everyone. And uh, with that, I'm going to say check out the other videos and Greg out.